Okay, let's resume where we left off. In our last tutorial, we talked about three commonly used design patterns in a microservice architecture, going over the database per service, the API gateway and the event-driven design pattern. Today, we're going to expand this discussion by diving into two more patterns, the service registry and discovery pattern, and the circuit breaker one. And we'll conclude this tutorial by bringing all five patterns together, applying them to our e-commerce solution. If this sounds good, let's dive in. Let's talk about the service registry and discovery pattern, which I should qualify as plural, because we have a few options here. But first, this pattern aims to solve the problem of dynamically locating and communicating with services in a distributed system. Its primary purposes are to maintain an up-to-date catalog of available service instances, enable automatic service registration and deregistration, facilitate dynamic scaling and load balancing, and last but not least, improve system resilience and fault tolerance. At a 50,000 feet view, this pattern involves two main components. First, a service registry, which can be described as a database that stores information about available service instances, including their network locations. A service can either self-register at startup or rely on a third party that leverages the service's heartbeats. The second component is a service discovery, which is the mechanism by which a service can find the other services it can interact with. There are two discovery approaches here, a client side and a server side. We'll talk about both shortly. Let's however talk briefly about the main challenges of this pattern. First, we must ensure the registry is always up to date, limiting temporary inconsistencies, so that we can avoid directing traffic to unavailable instances. Then, we need to consider possible performance overhead. Frequent registry queries can impact performance. Implement caching mechanisms to reduce this overhead. Of course, the registry itself can become a bottleneck and become a single point of failure. So, please, 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 implement high availability and fault tolerance for your registry. Then, as usual, we have the problem of security. Failing to secure the service registry can expose sensitive information about your infrastructure. If you think about it, the registry is like a DNS and while DNS-based discovery is simple, it may not be suitable for highly dynamic environments due to caching and propagation delays. A common mistake with this pattern is neglecting to implement robust health checks within each microservice, as it can lead to routing traffic to unhealthy instances. Last, failing to implement proper load balancing strategies can result in uneven distribution of traffic. So you want to avoid that too. Now, let's see how to implement this pattern. And, as you now understand, there are two components with this pattern, the service registry and the service discovery. Since I'm very logical, I'm an AI-generated voice after all. Let's first look at the former. And as always, let's start with our favorite four sample microservices and add to this initial picture our service registry. As all other services, the service registry relies on a database, which stores information on the microservices available within the ecosystem of a solution. So, how does a service registry work? There are two alternatives. The first one depends on self-service registration. In this alternative, at startup, each microservice registers itself to the registry. And, when shutting down, each microservice deregisters. Simple, right? The second alternative relies on a third party with a registrar that takes the ownership and responsibility to monitor the health of microservices and registers or deregisters them based on their health status. And yes, this implies that with this alternative, if you want a new microservice to contribute to the overall solution, it must provide the registrar with the ability to monitor its current state. Now, let's look at the second component of this pattern, the discovery. How does a microservice discovers its partner in crime? Well, they discover them thanks to the service registry database. And, here again, there are two alternatives for the discovery pattern. In the first alternative, each microservice can query the service registry to retrieve the needed info of other microservices. This approach is called a client-side discovery. The second alternative is a server-side discovery, which relies on a proxy to assist each microservice to interact with others without having to worry about anything. The proxy fully takes ownership to figure out how to route requests between microservices. Pretty cool, right? Let's now discuss the circuit breaker pattern. The circuit breaker pattern aims to 1. 
prevent cascading failures in distributed systems. 2. Improve system resilience and fault tolerance. 3. Reduce the impact of service failures on the overall system. 4. Allow rapid failure detection and recovery. But how does this pattern work? This pattern operates like an electrical circuit breaker, monitoring the flow of requests between services. But instead of being a two-state circuit breaker, it has three states. Closed, which is the normal operation. The requests pass through open when a failure is detected. The requests are immediately rejected. And half open when we test if the service has recovered from a previous failure. To simplify, when a service fails repeatedly, the circuit breaker trips to the open state, preventing further requests. And, after a defined timeout, it switches to half open to test if the service has recovered. Now, there are always challenges and common mistakes. To avoid when implementing this pattern to enhance the resilience and reliability of your microservices architecture. First common mistake is setting the failure threshold too low or too high, which can lead to premature tripping or delayed response to failures. Next is failing to set appropriate timeouts that can result in resources being held unnecessarily or premature request termination. Third, it's the lack of monitoring. Not implementing proper monitoring and alerting for circuit breaker state changes can indeed lead to undetected issues. Then, we have ignoring partial failures. Focusing only on complete service failures and neglecting degraded performance scenarios. Another common mistake is over-reliance on circuit breakers. Using circuit breakers as a sole solution for fault tolerance is simply wrong. Rather it should be part of a comprehensive resilience strategy, and we'll talk about that in another video. Last common mistake, failing to thoroughly test the circuit breaker behavior under various failure scenarios can lead to unexpected issues in production. Okay, let us double click on how to implement this pattern within our now infamous e-commerce solution. Okay. Let's apply the circuit breaker pattern to our e-commerce solution and more specifically to the inventory service to better protect the product service. Picture this. We've just received a large shipment of the latest iPhone in our warehouse, and we want to update the inventory to reflect the correct items we have in stock. The first thing the inventory service is going to do is to call the product service to get the product ID for the latest iPhone. The inventory service calls the product service and obtains the product ID. So far, all is good. The circuit breaker from the inventory service to the product service is closed. Some orders are then placed by our customers to purchase the new model, and the inventory service calls once again the product service to ensure the ordered product is the right one, but this time, the call fails. The call is retried but fails again. This breaches our defined threshold and the circuit break trips. After a short timeout, using for example, an exponential back-off logic, the call is retried but fails once more. Finally, after an even longer timeout, using some type of jitter randomization logic, the circuit breaker is reset going to the half-open state, allowing the inventory service to try again the call. This time, we're lucky, the product service responds successfully, and we can close the circuit breaker. However, if the call fails again, then we're going back to the open state to provide additional time to the product service to recover from its failure. Now, as a solution architect or a microservice owner, there are several critical questions to answer when implementing this pattern. When should the circuit trip? How many failed requests within a certain period should we consider for the decision? How do we quantify a failure? What's the expected time or SLA the product service should respond to our request before we consider it a failure? When does the circuit can be closed again? How long after a circuit trip we should try again? How long should we give to the product service to recover? Long story short, there are a few non-trivial questions that must be answered before implementing such pattern. And while the idea of this pattern is fairly simple, it does require us to think carefully on how to prevent a complete system failures by stopping calls to a specific service experiencing a problem. Of course, this opens another set of intriguing questions around how to build resilient systems. And this is exactly what we'll discuss in a future tutorial. But first, let's bring together all the patterns we discussed today and in part 4 and see how our initial monolithic e-commerce platform is transformed when applying all these patterns. Let us start where it all begins. The customer. An end user makes a call to access our website. The request is handled by our API gateway. Since the customer is not authenticated yet, the API gateway requests the user to log in. 
So the user provides their credentials and obtains an access token from our identity and access management microservice. Obviously, the API gateway knows where to send the login request because of our service registry and discovery. Here, we use the third-party approach. When our microservices start, the registrar detects them and updates the registry. Then, once the user is finally authenticated and authorized, the user can start navigating our e-commerce and shop happily. And you can see, our e-commerce solution relies on a message broker to communicate and fulfill the user's requests. That's neat, right? So, what do we do next? In our next hands-on tutorial, we'll complete the implementation of our identity and access management microservice leveraging JWT and Spring Security. All right, this is it for today. But don't you worry, there's plenty more coming. So, please, stay tuned, and subscribe if you'd like to get notified when the next tutorial is published. And on that note, see you soon.